We are, we are in uh, the book of Romans chapter 11, and you rem- may remember chapters 9, 10, and 11. He is going to show us that indeed he can keep his promises to Israel. He keep, keeps his promises to the, uh, and so therefore he can also keep his promises to the Gentiles. And this can happen because, because he's the one who's shown forth toward us. He's the one who's demonstrated that that if there's any failure, it's never been on his part. It's always been on the part of, of people not following. And, uh, so let's, let's just recap a little bit so that we remember the context. So we're going to start reading at chapter 11 of Romans, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11. I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgressions, <clears throat> is riches for the world, and their future is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead. So we we talked about this portion last time that God is going to take Gentiles, bring them into fellowship with Jesus, bring them into fellowship with the Lord, and they will have such a love for God, it's going to make Jews jealous for God. And that's going to draw in Jews. When the Jews start getting drawn in, what's going to happen is that it's going to be life from the dead for the Gentiles, and we looked at that in in light of what it, it, it might mean is is the uh, is the rapture, and then the then once the fullness of the Gentiles is reached, we'll, we'll talk about. But that's what we were talking about. That this jealousy is going to move them, so that the Jews' rebellion causes Gentiles. God says, okay, and He causes Gentiles to come in. Those Gentiles coming in causes jealousy to the Jews, so they start coming in. The Jews start coming in. And that brings the fulfillment of the Gentiles. I mean, it's it's just, just a wonderful plan of God. So let's start reading from verse 16. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in his in his kindness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For if God is able to graft, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be get grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. For a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Okay, so... In verse 16, it says, as the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. It's interesting. He says, if Israel, since Israel is holy, you are coming in, you are branches coming off this root. And this root is of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what he's talking about is he's talking about the blessing, the blessing of the land of Israel, the blessing of the kingdom of Israel. The blessing of being of this nation of Israel, as we had read about in Romans chapter four, 
in Romans chapter four, that, that you become partakers of this when you believe. You become, you become children of Abraham. He's saying this to the Gentiles. So in Romans chapter four, it said in verse 16, Romans 4, 16, for this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are in the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. And so you see that <clears throat> that he, he he's opening this up. He's opening this up to the Gentiles. He says, look, if this blessing was holy, it's going to transfer. So this, there's this conferring of holiness from one to the next. There's this conferring of holiness from the patriarchs, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through this, this main part of the dough, you take a piece of that, that holiness is conferred. You take a tree. If the, if, if the root is holy, the branches are as well. It's conferred. And we see, we see things like this. We see this, this holiness conferred. So one of the things that came to memory when I, when I saw this is that, is that, uh, um, this instruction in first Corinthians chapter seven, verse 12, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse 12, it says, he's giving counsel on marriage and he says, but to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, she, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. So he's saying, if, if, if a brother find, is married to an unbeliever, so somebody comes to know the Lord and his wife's an unbeliever, he says, don't divorce her. He says, if she's willing to live with you, don't divorce her. And he says, and if a woman who is an, un, who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. She had no ability to divorce him in those days. And, uh, uh, I think that that might even still be the case in Israel. It might have overchanged recently, but it, it, a woman does not even have the ability to divorce him. She goes to send him away. So, you know, the, 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 the woman kind of runs the roost and, uh, uh, she can send him away. And, uh, uh, but she can't technically divorce him. That's what he's talking about. He says, for if the, he, he says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they're holy. He's saying your children are holy because one parent knows the law. So you see this holiness conferred. And so, so you see this, this type of thing. And, and if I could encourage something to, for parents, I mean, uh, children are barometers of, of, um, of deception. They, they, they really see hypocrisy. Children see hypocrisy so much. So when people say, well, we're going to start going to church because it's good for the kids. I'm like, you, you just have this totally mixed up totally mixed up you don't go for the children's sake you go because it's the right thing to do if you go just because of the children's sake they'll see the hypocrisy and they'll run from it look in psalm 112 verse 1 and 2 psalm 112 verse 1 and 2 praise the lord how blessed is the man who fears the lord who greatly delights in his commandments it is so blessed to fear the lord and to delight in his commandments to delight in the things of god What's the outcome of fearing the Lord and delighting in his commandments? Verse 2 of Psalm 112. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. The best thing you can do for your children is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the best thing that you can do for your children is to fear God and keep his commandments. When you do that, your children will become mighty on earth. Think about this promise. Think about this. You want your children to do well? I've never met anybody who didn't want their children to do well. You want your children to do well? Fear God and keep his commandments. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord and greatly delights in his commandments. Where he makes the commandments of God not a torture, but a delight. I delight to do thy will, O God. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. There is this holiness that is conferred to your children through your walk with God. There's this blessing that is transferred through your walk with God. This is the best thing that you can do. If you just do this because you say, well, we, we go for the kids' sake, they're going to see the hypocrisy and they're going to run from this. They're barometers of hypocrisy. 
kids see duplicity very, very well. And, and, uh, so, so you, you see this, this conference of, of holiness. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 11. But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. This is the blessing. This is not just coming into Israel. This is the blessing that comes from Israel. This is the blessing that was, was given to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can come into that, he says. He says to that, up in verse 13, he says, he says, uh, 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 I'm, I'm speaking now, I'm speaking now to the Gentiles. He's speaking now to the Gentiles in verse 13. He tells us he's speaking now to the Gentiles. He said, you can become a partaker with them. This is this place of blessing, this amazing place of blessing that you can come into. If you look in, 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 uh, in first Corinthians, in first Corinthians, just this, just this beautiful promise when you come into this. First Corinthians chapter one, verse four. First Corinthians chapter one, verse four says, I thank my God concerning you for the grace of God, which is given you in Christ Jesus. He says, I thank God for the grace of God. That's an undeserved gift for the grace of God that's been given to you in Christ Jesus. If you be in Jesus Christ, if you be in the Lord, there is this amazing grace that showers upon you because God's goodness funnels, funnels to us through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus. This amazing grace comes to us through Jesus. And then he says that in everything you were enriched, in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and in all knowledge. I mean, think about that. That when we be in Christ, if we will only but believe, in everything, in every way we are enriched in him, in all speech and in all knowledge, in every way we are enriched in him, in all speech and in all knowledge. I mean, this is an amazing promise. I think about this and say, Lord, my research is blessed. My teaching is blessed. My, 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 my discussions with people is, it's all blessed. This is everything from your speech to your knowledge. It's all blessed. Everything. If you be in Christ, remember, what what we what we've read many times in Acts chapter four that if you don't have faith you lose it you just you, you just can't appropriate this, these things I mean we we've got to believe these things uh, we've got to take hold of this so so in, in in Acts chapter in Acts chapter four verse Acts chapter four verse um no, it's not Acts chapter four. Anyway, I can't find it now. Anyway, so, but, but we have to take these things by faith. We have to take hold of these things by faith. That these things that God has given us, the things that God has taught us. He says that in everything, in, from all speech to all knowledge, every way you are blessed. He says, you're not lacking in any gift. Every gift that I need, he's given me. It's not like we all have the same gifts. No, he's given us exactly what we need in life. It is a matter of walking in it. He says, you can come into these things. You are a partaker of the rich root of the olive tree. That's this place of blessing. You become, you come into this place. I'm telling you, if you don't take hold of these things, you lose out in life. He says, the, the, the scriptures tell us that they did not gain it because they did not take hold of it in faith. They did not unite it by faith. We have to believe this. He says, you become, you become a part of this rich place of blessing that's given to you. There's this rich place of blessing that is given to us in Jesus Christ. Everything. He says in all speech and in all knowledge. Did you know he's given you all the knowledge that you are going to need? He's given it to you for your career. He's given it to you. You know, you, you want to figure these things out. You, you, you got to solve all sorts of problems in your career. I mean, all sorts of problems you got to solve. I mean, whether you're a physician, you've got to diagnose people. Whether you're a scientist, you've got to figure things out. Whether you're an accountant, you've got to figure out how, 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 do you, how do you structure this, this, this deal. What do you do? He says, in all speech and in all knowledge, God's given you this. He says, you can become a partaker of this. That's in, in, in Romans chapter 11, verse 17. Now, verse 18. He says, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, 
but the root supports you. You will say the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. This is not talking about one's salvation. This is talking about the rich root of blessing. You will fall away from this place of blessing. Now, I'll, I'll just give you my, my my observation in life. Some people among Christians have very little regard for the Jews. They have very little regard for the Jews. And what I have seen that people who are like that have very little regard for the Jews that think that they have, that, 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 that in Christ somehow now you, the church has supplanted all the blessings that were given to Israel and, and God is no longer into that anymore. That, that, uh, what I have seen in those people is they're already separated from the place of blessing. They're already cynical in life. They're usually fairly bitter people. That's what I've seen. For those that do not love Israel, they're already bitter. It's not like, oh, you know, I have to warn them. You're going to fall into a place of bitterness. They're already there. It's, they're already there. And it's exactly what it says here, because God has this, this amazing sense that he's, he's given to Israel. Remember the, the, we read about this when we studied, when we studied the book of Genesis, formerly, uh, uh, the last book we had studied was the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 12, he says this to Abraham. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will bless those who bless you. The same word is used twice. I will bless those, bless. I will bless those who bless you. What they give to you, I will give back to them. I will bless those who bless you. But the next sentence, he says, and the one who curses you, I will curse. It translates into our English Bible as the same word. Curse, curse. Those who curse you, I will curse. It's not the same word. We talked about this. It, it's, it's the one who disesteems you. Just a simple disesteeming. The one who disesteems you. I will harm. I will hurt. I mean, it, it's, it's totally asymmetric. The one who just looks down upon you. I will hurt them. It's like, yikes. You want to be careful about this. That's what he's saying. To those who disesteem you, I will harm them. I mean, this is a promise of God. So he says, don't be proud thinking that, that your church is going to somehow supplant all the blessings that he's given to Israel. We're going to see in this chapter, he says, none of the blessings I gave them are lost. There's been no transfer. They're going to get exactly what I promised to them. They're going to get. There's no, been no transfer of this. They're going to get exactly what I promised them. That's what they're going to get. And he says, he says, uh, don't be proud against them or, or you're going to end up falling away from this tree of blessing. And that's what I've seen. They're, they've already fallen away. They're already falling away. There's nothing there for them. They're already bitter about this thing. And, and it's very hard to turn them back. You know, you can show them scriptures and hope, hope that, that the conviction of God comes upon them. And so this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about Jews. He's talking about Gentiles. And he says, you're going to separate yourself from this place of blessing. He says, uh, verse 22 of, of Romans chapter 11. Behold, then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, unless otherwise you also will be cut off. Just as they were cut off from this root of blessing, you'll be cut off too. He's speaking to Gentiles. You'll be cut off too. That's why I warn you. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that the, the, the current state of Israel does. No way. You don't have to agree with that. But when it comes to your actions toward the Jews, just remember that that is, they are of the root that supports us. That is so important to take hold of. And and if you've got a problem, I encourage you to not voice it, to not go about voicing it. You know, you take that to the Lord. Because remember, when you pray to Jesus, when you pray to Jesus, you're going to be talking to a Jew. Right? So just be careful how you even pray about this sort of thing. Because he's warned us. Because you're talking to a Jew. Jesus was never a Christian. Did you know that? He was never a Christian. 
He never said he was a Christian. He never came to start a Christian movement. Movement. They were later called Christians. This was something, this was a term that people called them. And then finally to the point where Peter said, don't be embarrassed about this name. But it was something that people called them. And uh, uh, so anyway, he, he says, he, he, he says that you be cut off too. verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree in verse 24, and you were grafted in contrary to nature. Now, some some smart people who, who know a lot about botany, they tell me that that you can't take a wild olive branch and put it into a domesticated olive tree. Well, it says right here, it was contrary to nature. Can God do something that he wants to do? God does things contrary to nature all the time, called miracles. And uh, uh, so God is able to do this. He says they were grafted in contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? And this is what you see. You know, some people will, will come to me and they'll say, well, you know, how can you be Jewish and believe this stuff? I'm like, how can you be a Gentile and believe this? The New Testament is so Jewish. It's so Jewish. You read the New Testament, it is so Jewish. It is not Gentile. It is so Jewish. That's why when we studied uh, um, the chronological life of Jesus, we covered all four Gospels. That's up on my website, jmtour.com. It's 184 messages. It took me years of these Sunday messages to get through that. We looked at the chronological life of Jesus from the Messianic perspective, from the Jewish perspective. And you see that when you understand the Jewish culture of that day, you're like, this is so Jewish. He says, this is just natural for them to come into this. It is so natural for them to come in. For I do, verse 25, for I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. A partial hardening has come on to the Jews, has come on, on to the Jews, onto Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. This fullness means number. There is a certain number of Gentiles that are coming into the kingdom of God. There's a certain number of Gentiles. When that number is reached, something big is going to happen. God has a number, a number, which is going to be reached. When they come in, then something's going to happen. He's hardened Israel's heart to allow this influx of Gentiles. You think he's favored Israel over, over the Gentiles? He's done a lot for the Gentiles. And he's just bringing them in. He's just bringing them in to make Israel more and more jealous. He's, he's bringing them in to make them more jealous. And so you see that, that, uh, um, he says, he says this partial hardening, a partial hardening, because it's not a full hardening, because Jews are coming in. And it's happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is his covenant with them when I take away their sins. So what he does is he says, once that fullness comes in, all Israel will be saved. Many think that this is after the rapture. The Gentiles are going to, those in Christ are going to be taken away. And then Israel at that, after that Israel, all Israel is going to be saved. And this may actually be, or, or, or one, one may suggest that, that this is, uh, this is after the rapture and halfway through the tribulation period when they see the abomination of desolations and this, this agreement is broken with the Antichrist and you see massive numbers of Jews that are going to be saved. But he says, all Israel, all Israel is going to be saved. There is going to be something to happen. And all Israel, in mass, Israel is coming in. I gave you the statistics before of how many, how many uh, uh, Jews are now getting saved. The number is ramping up historically more than any other time in history. The number of Jews coming to know the Lord as the Messiah and, and the Lord Jesus as Messiah. But when that fullness, when that full number is hit, and I have no idea when it comes. I mean, some people think we, you know, this, this, this is the last days, you know, it could happen at any, it could, it could, it might not, it might not happen for a few hundred years. It might not happen for a few thousand years. I don't know because nobody knows 
the, the day or the hour. And, and you say, well, we, we see signs of the times. We've seen signs of the times for a long time. And, and uh, um, you know, I've been a believer for over 40 years. And I can remember sitting in elders meetings where people would come in and they'd say, you know, it's just on the verge. It's just on the verge. And, you know, they're, they're dead and gone. And, you know, there's a new generation come. So we don't know the day and the hour. But he tells us, he says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. So he's, he's, he's citing from Isaiah 59. And then he cites from Isaiah 27. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God is going to come and he's going to take away sins. I told you one of the, the most powerful verses that Charles Spurgeon says in evangelism, one of the most powerful verses is Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And whenever I share the gospel, I share this verse. Because it's just amazing. I, even I, this is God is emphatic. This is me speaking. I, even I, Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. Because many times people feel, it doesn't happen with young people. It happens with middle-aged and older people. They think I have done too much wrong in my life to be able to accept so free of salvation. They just can't accept this concept like this. And and I say, God is doing this for his own sake. He's not going to leave you here for his own sake. He's going to, he's going to uh, wipe out your transgressions for his own sake. That's how much he cares about you, for his own sake. And he's not going to remember your sin. Same idea here. He is going to take away their sins. He is going to do it. God is going to do it. And it says in verse 27, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is my covenant with them. I promised it to them. You think this has been transferred to some other people? No way. This is my promise to them. Promises have been made and promises are going to be kept. Verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. So you, you see that there's this contrary nature in them. There, there's this contrary feeling in them that, that uh, um, in, in the Jews where they will oppose us in this. But it says they are beloved for the sake of their fathers because of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They are loved. I'm telling you, you want blessings. From your children, you get to know God and start loving him. There is blessing conferred to your children because of the love of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their obedience to God. Because of that, he says, they are loved for the sake of their fathers. There's this holiness that is conferred for the sake of the fathers. I'm telling you, the best thing that you can do for your children is learn to fear God and keep his commandments. None of this stuff where we go to church for my kids' sake. No. You go to church because it's the right thing to do. You fellowship, you read the Bible because it's the right thing to do. And then your children come along. He says, he says in, in verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their dis- disobedience. So these also now have, uh, have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. He says for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The things that I promised Israel are irrevocable. You can't go back on it. We have to understand when God says something, it has to happen. It just can't change. God is not like a man that he should lie or he should change his mind. When God says it, Heaven and earth conform to his word. And this blessing comes. If you don't know the Lord, I urge you, I urge you this day to come to him. I urge you this day to learn to participate in this blessing. You can have this blessing in Jesus Christ and it only comes in him. If you don't know the Lord, please come to him this day. In Jesus, you can have this. You can have this. And, and you know, I've said this so many times. If you would just meet with me, Give me one hour with you. I'll share with you. You'll get saved that very day. And, so, and believers write to me all the time. And they say, how can you say that? that you, don't, you don't convert people. Well, look, I know you're Mr. You're Mrs. Theologian. You know everything, okay? But 
I kind of like the way I do it and see people coming to the Lord all the time. It really, really works because I really believe this. You know, I never say that I'm going to save people. No way. God saves them. But I lead them to the Lord. Even if I say I lead them to the Lord, it gets people upset. No, I, I led them to the Lord. Remember w- w- what happened? Andrew, P- Peter's brother, he, 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 uh, 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 he led Jesus. He says, come and see the Messiah. He said, come and see the Messiah. He led him to Jesus. And then, boom, he's getting saved. You know, this sort of thing. You, you, you know, I, I, I was reading reading this week in in, uh, in in the gospel account according to Luke. Gospel account according to Luke. And it's talking about John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist is going to lead many, many back to the faith. He led them to the faith. John the Baptist did this. It is the Lord who saves. So what I have seen is I lead people to Jesus and they get saved. Please come to me. If you do not know the Lord, give me this opportunity to share with you. Come to me. Come to me and I will lead you to Jesus. I will show you how to get to Jesus. There is blessing. There is so much blessing in this. So much blessing in knowing the Lord. Please give your heart to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. You can come into this place of blessing. Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. If you are a Jew and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not entering into this place of blessing. There's no other way into this. It's all through Jesus Christ. Once the Messiah has come, there's no other way. It's got to be through Jesus himself. That's the only way to get to, to, to God is through Jesus. And you will see it will because be because of the Messiah. He's going to open up this door that eventually all of Israel will be saved. Come to the Lord. You don't have to live excluded from this blessing. Now, if you know the Lord, I, I urge you, I urge you to walk, to walk in this place of blessing. I urge you to walk in this place of blessing. There's this, there's this, uh, um, there's this amazing blessing that comes if you get to know the Lord. This amazing blessing that comes if you get to know the Lord. There's so much that you can have once you know the Lord. He, he says, it, from all speech and all knowledge. If you don't know God, you're just fighting this fight all alone. You don't have to do this. God is with you. God can do this. And you can take hold of this thing. You've got to take hold of it by faith. You've got to, to, to take hold of this by faith. God has this for you. I urge you to believe these things, to take hold of this, to say, Lord, work in my heart. Raise my faith. Lord, help me with this. And if you will daily come before the Lord, He becomes your best friend. He becomes your best friend. I urge you to daily have a time with the Lord. When I lead people to the Lord, I say 15 minutes for the rest of your life. 15 minutes every morning. Spend time in the word of God. Reading slowly, pensively, carefully. Asking God to speak to you. If you know the Lord and you don't have a daily time of regular reading. Where you pick up a book of the Bible. And read through that whole book where you left. Pick up where you left off the day before. You're missing out on so much. You miss out on so much. I urge you to have this time with the Lord because all of this comes out of the depth of relationship with God. He has this place of blessing. If you don't appropriate it, you don't get it. Doesn't mean you lost lost your salvation. No, you got your salvation. But you're not partaking of the rich root that's there for you, that rich root of blessing. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for what you've given us in it, for the truth of it. Lord, I pray for the unbelievers, the unbelievers on this, in this class today. Lord, I pray that you would so work in their lives to draw them to Jesus. Father, that they would give me just one hour of their time so that they could, I could bring them to Jesus, to the feet of Jesus, that they would get saved. Father, save their souls, I pray. Save their souls. Turn them to you. Father, for those who know you, Lord, I pray that they would be able to partake partake of this rich root of blessing, to have this holiness conferred. Father, that they could have life in themselves. Lord, I pray that you would cause them to have a daily time with you and that they would learn to fear God and keep his commandments, that they would fear God and keep his commandments. Lord, I commit this to you. Glory be to your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Glory be to your name. In the name of Jesus.
Amen.